Well, hello, my name is Sean Smith. I'm at the University of Kansas, and I uh, wanted to visit with you shortly about uh, what the reopening might look like. Now, I'm here in June. August might be the reopening for some. September might be the reopening for others. But we know that the last three months, March, April, May, as we were finishing up school, and for some of us, we went into June, that the fall of 2020 will not be like the fall of 2019. Still probably working on operationalizing that, what it's going to look like, what it's not going to look like. But we can look back beyond or prior to the pandemic as we plan for some of the reopening to lessons learned, um, things that we could actually apply, and a host of other things. And so I want to spend a few minutes here, get us started thinking about kind of looking backward, but also planning forward. And while we may have several months before we're with our students again, there's several things we can be doing over these next several months to really think about ways of what we learned over the last three months and or four months, how to apply those in August and September, but also looking even prior to March. And what I mean by that is that thinking about that blended online hybrid learning. Now, first of all, if we look backwards and we think about kind of one word to describe what actually our experiences were like during March, April, May, and into June, depending upon when our students finished. Uh, I was actually with a group of individuals uh, not too long ago, face-to-face, -face, a number of educators. And when we looked at one word, I actually used Answer Garden. And if you're unfamiliar with Answer Garden, it's a great website to basically crowdsource an understanding of where folks are thinking. And these were a group of educators. And I said, you know, use one or two words to reflect on everything, the instruction, um, your interaction with the students, and, and everything from uh, innovative, in a very positive way, to frustrated, anxious, sad, um, missing out, of course those are two words, and a host of other things. You know, these last three months when we were finishing up the spring semester were not what we normally planned for. It's, 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 it's unlike anything we probably have ever lived through, and hopefully it will be unlike anything we live th through in the future. But as we look towards this reopening in 2021, there's a number of things that we can actually take heart on. So first of all, urging us to reflect back on, and in this series, we'll continue to reflect back on to plan forward. But there's also things to reflect back on even prior to the pandemic to help us plan forward to this reopening, which we don't exactly know what it's gonna look like, but there's a good possibility it will involve some face-to-face, -face, and there's a good possibility it involves some sort of blended, some sort of hybrid, some sort of online. Now, for some of us, when we think about that, we often think about the online as the last three months, but I want to kind of shift that just a bit. And as we look at reflections, we could, we could look at a number of different things. We could look at the basic operations, and we're not going to get into that. And that would be everything from hand cleaning to where the students are going to distance themselves to how many students are going to be in the room to how our classrooms are going to be organized. You may be on a, a re-entry or a replanning or a reopening team, which is great, uh, but if not, administrators, other folks in the building will be able to clarify that for us. What I want to focus in on this area of curriculum and instruction, this area of design, this area of planning that we can control and that actually kind of took us for a loop where that we were planning for face-to-face, -face, we we're instructing face-to-face, -face, and all of a sudden we we're entirely at a distance, t t entirely remote uh, for the last several months of the academic year, 2019-2020. Uh, so with that said, I want to begin with letting us know prior to the pandemic, there was a lot of things going on with millions of students, thousands of teachers, if not tens of thousands of teachers, millions of families involved in fully online, but also blended learning. Maybe you're building your blended learning. Maybe you are a one-to-one -one initiative, or maybe you went into the classroom and students opened up their iPad or their Google Chromebook or their laptop, and they signed into a content management system like um, IXL, or maybe they uh, connected into Connections Academy, or maybe they went on to Khan Academy, and they did a, a series of lessons. Now, some of you are like, nope, didn't do any of that. Well, please know that there were a number of lessons learned from folks, peers across the country, doing blended, personalized, hybrid, fully online learning. Now, some of that took place inside the brick and mortar classroom. It did not involve anything at the home environment. Others of us, prior to the pandemic, it was all the home environment with teachers remotely, teachers potentially teaching actually from their living rooms because they were fully virtual teachers prior to the pandemic as well. 
The district I live in, actually a thousand of the 11,000 students uh, are virtual. Uh, prior to the pandemic, they were fully online. Uh, they learned at home or the library or wherever and their educators were fully online, and many of them were at home providing that education. So there's a number of lessons learned there. And one of the lessons learned is the fact that the blended learning has a number of different options. And so as we plan for the future, as we plan for 2021, uh, 2020 and 2021 academic year, we need to kind of look sideways a bit at the blended learning models. So some of us may find ourselves with our students for a portion of the day, and then, of course, the child returns home for a portion of the day to deal with social distancing and the number of students we serve. Others of us may be in a building where we're going to be able to have all our students there, but we may not be able to have all our students at one time. They may be rotating in and out so we have less time with them. And maybe instead they're doing more blended learning. It could be in the cafeteria or the gymnasium or in the auditorium where they're opening up their iPad or their Chromebook or their laptop and they're going on to these online lessons that we're designing and or finding and assigning. So these things have come across in a variety of different formats. So we've had flex rotation models, we've had flipped classrooms, and each of them have had their own different element to them. So for example, station rotation for our elementary peers would know that, oh, we do a lot of station rotation right now. And so, oh, they actually signed on to their computers during the station rotation, and they did independent reading or independent listening or watched a video or engaged in an online activity. Yep, we're doing that prior to the pandemic, and we very well may be doing it post the pandemic. That allowed for some personalized learning, that allowed for some individual pacing, that allowed for teachers to be able to have practice and flexibility and enrichment going on with their students. So a lot of positive things potentially happening with students, and particularly all students, including those with disabilities, English language learners, those at the margins that need the additional support. You know, that, that lab support in terms of small group interaction it may be, again, at a social distance, but engaged collaboratively with a number of online tools. And of course, the flipped classroom. Many of us have heard of the flipped classroom, and it might be the fact that we're going to do more of a kind of interactive lesson face-to-face, -face, but they need to understand the content prior to coming into the classroom. So they're going to read, they're going to watch some videos, they're going to watch a presentation from us, they're going to listen to some resources, and then when they hit the ground with us face-to-face, -face, that's all covered, and now we get to expand it, interact with it, engage it, discuss it. And that's a phenomenal model, particularly, I'd argue, for our upper elementary, middle, and secondary students. Each one of these blended learning model components have something different about them. And so one of our things over the summer is to better understand those elements and better understand that preparation and better connect and planning and how it aligns to our needs, realizing that we don't exactly know what reopening is going to look like. So, for example, with blended learning, as we, as we go into it, we realized that blended learning prior to the pandemic taught us that, gosh, it can really help with reinforcement. It could really enhance what we've tried to do face to face. That just in time instruction as well, it might be some individuals that are doing enrichment sitting right next to someone else on the iPad that's doing more drill and practice on a lesson and someone else doing something in between, all somewhat personalized to their needs depending upon the online resource or resources we're asking them to use. Of course, there's practice, there's enrichment, there's contextualization where maybe they're watching a video and they're getting a better connection to what we're about to talk about or what we just talked about and a host of other things. You know, blended learning also through our content management systems, those are our CMSs, and our learning management systems. And what's the difference, Sean? Well, we'll get to bit into that a little deeper in our next session, but you know, content management systems are often the ones that come with full lessons, that come with uh, a connection to the standard, that come with that independence where there's a uh, multiple choice or some sort of assessment at the end, all pre-made for us. And so, of course, we assign based on the needs of the child. Where a learning management system is more that shell, Google Classroom, Blackboard, where we can input some of our own resources, connect to resources that have been created, but all inside the container, that learning container, that we then get to create all the different components. And there's advantages there, what we'll talk about a little bit later as well. But the beauty of the a blended or the data-driven online learning aspect is that we have dashboards, both in the LMS and the CMS, to find out that formative feedback about how individuals are going. There's a, a, an enhanced level of student engagement that's often reported with good blended learning. Um, there's also team-based 
activities where we're interacting collaboratively with peers that are helping to facilitate some of this blended learning where we're not engaged directly with a student, but they're potentially somewhere else in the building or at home with an adult facilitating that. And we'll get into that aspect as well. So when we think about blended learning, some of the questions that we need to ask ourselves, and I would urge us to ask ourselves over the next several months as we plan for this reopening, is that what are we going to do face to face? What's the critical big ideas? What's essential in the types of instruction that I do as a kindergarten teacher versus a ninth grade science teacher? What is so important face to face that I really can't mimic it? when it comes to Zoom or when it comes to other online tools. Or potentially, I can't do that because I'm teaching face-to-face -face while some of my students are online. What do I do face-to-face? -face? And then what do I do digitally? That's that second question. So what would be more appropriate for digitally? It might be that flipped classroom where do they really need to listen to me lecture for 10 or 15 minutes when I have them face-to-face? -face? Could I not provide some sort of great, rich resource that they could watch, read, listen to, connect the dots, and then when they're with me, it's not so much me disseminating information, but actually actively engaging them in that learning. Um, you know, how do we empower folks that are going to work with us in this new blended learning? It might be uh, continue to be the adult at the home that we engage during the last three to four months uh, with that fully online learning. I would urge us to continue to empower the adults at home. But it also may be colleagues at school who are now facilitating the blended learning that's taking place outside my classroom because, again, due to social distancing, we're having to divide and conquer with our students. And so maybe other professionals, maybe some aides, maybe some additional teachers, maybe some teachers in the fine arts that are now engaged in more of the academics depending upon my grade level. All those, how do I engage and how do I collaborate with them? And more importantly or most importantly for me is what are our big ideas? We're going to have to declutter elements of what we work on this coming fall, this coming spring. We're not going to be able to potentially cover all the geography. And some states are actually reorganizing some of the critical standards for this coming ac academic year. We're hearing it not only at the state level, but also at the regional level as well. So what are our big ideas? What are things that have been maybe some wonderful enrichment activities that Honestly, we may not have the luxury to be able to facilitate, or those are the things that go online digitally that become supplemental. Those are things we're really going to have to consider. And then, of course, from that, what tools do I use? Not only digital tools, but other strategies and instructional tools that might be required to be facilitated by someone besides myself, the adult in the home, et cetera, et cetera. So those are critical questions we're going to need to be asking ourselves in preparation for this blended learning. So as we take a break here, and I'll ask you to process a few things. Uh, we can learn from the past in blended learning. We can grab from what we know about blended learning to apply it to the reopening that we're still a little uncertain about. We can reflect on what took place during this immediate, all of a sudden, online, and to, uh, consider some of the tools that were very much a factor in this success, but also the roles of our uh, role as an educator, but also the role of educators and parents that worked with us as well, and a host of other things. So when we come back, we'll try to make some connections. And I'm going to first center on some elementary educators, and then we'll shift over to some upper elementary, more middle school folks in terms of things we can do for that reopening and planning. Hope this has been helpful. Hope it connected a few dots in realizing that we're not uh, going into this reentry or reopening uh, blind. It's not like we don't have a map. Blended learning, hybrid learning provides us an excellent map about how to personalize learning uh, that's going to be face-to-face and potentially digital, depending upon how we operationalize things. So let's take a break. Hopefully this got us thinking, and uh, we'll connect the dots here in just a moment.